Now you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. But Christ can change your past. He died on the cross so that all the sins you've ever committed, all the things you've ever done wrong are forgiven. Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there. And they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior.
Hey church! Morning church, what a great day it is today because Jesus is alive. That's something to celebrate today and it's been great to be able to get this message across. We set up the kids church page this week yeah. and what an amazing time teaching the children exactly what it is that Christ did for us and then they can celebrate together with us today because Jesus is alive. Yeah, like Pastor Jane says, we've been getting that message to the children. But also the other message that we've been giving to our community is the daily devotions. And you know, church is a real encouragement to ourselves, but it's also encouraging the community around us by posting them daily on Facebook because we are showing them that the Psalm 91 really does bring a prayer of protection around us as a church and around our community. So I just encourage you, if you've not taken a look at those daily devotions, take a look now because they are incredible. They are awesome they are a blessing to you in our community and the other thing that we've been doing is our communion on a Thursday night and I encourage you to take a look at that as well we join every Thursday night at 6 30 and join us there church as well yeah what a brilliant time we've had this week and continue to have and we're just going to go into worship now so father we thank you and we give you praise lord we lift your name on high today because you are the king of kings and you are the lord of lords lord we thank you we can rejoice in this because this is a day that you have made amen amen
Good morning, guys. I want to thank you for joining us on our Easter service. And I want to thank Matt and Joy for the worship that they just led us in. It was a wonderful time of just being able to praise him and worship him. And you know, this morning we're on our Easter service. We're taking a look at the story of Easter and exactly what it means to us as Christians. And also what happened around the story of Easter. And maybe you've heard the story of Easter a thousand times. Maybe you've never heard of it before. Maybe you've heard of this guy called Jesus who died on a cross for you but you've never heard anything else. Maybe you don't know exactly what it all means. On Friday, we looked at the story of how Jesus had been taken to a cross, crucified and put in a grave. We call it Good Friday because it was the day that Jesus died for us. And then on Sunday, we rejoice on Easter Sunday because it represents the day when people went to the tomb to dress uh, the body and to put new dressing and new cloth on it. And as they turned up, they saw that the body was no longer there. The stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen. This is what we're celebrating this morning is that Jesus is not someone who died 2,000 years ago and is left in a tomb. But he's someone who died and is resurrected and is still living today. And I want to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit more about this Jesus who's alive and living today. But I want to start by telling you about another character that we read about in the Bible. And if you were to make a blockbuster film, I would say that this character would be definitely be a B-list celebrity. And not only that, he would probably be classed as a cameo role in the film that you were making. If this were a film, he would be the kind of character that you love because he's just a little bit daft, makes a lot of mistakes, but he's likeable in the end. 
This guy is a guy called Thomas, and many of you may have heard of Thomas without realizing it because you may have heard the phrase, a doubting Thomas. This is the guy that we're referring to, and he's not mentioned very much in the Bible, but he's one of Jesus's 12 disciples. He's one of the guys that spent three years with Jesus while he was on earth. And one of the passages that I want to look at that refers to Thomas is in John chapter 14. And we're going to start at verse 3. And Jesus is talking, and in verse 3 he says this. He says, And if I go, I will prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And in verse 4 he goes on to say, And where I go, you will know, and the way you will know. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now I find this passage a wonderful passage to read because as we look at the story of Thomas, Thomas has this reputation of being the guy who doubts things, the guy who questions things, the guy who's not willing to take anything at face value but needs to know for certain. I think if you were to characterise him today, you would be the guy who relies on facts and figures. And you know, I want to maybe fight Thomas's corner just a little bit this morning and suggest that maybe he wasn't a guy who doubted everything, but maybe Thomas was just a little bit of a realist who needed to know that this is exactly how things work. He wanted to make sure that he understood everything. He needed all the facts and figures in place. And I love this passage here because as Thomas says to Jesus, where are you going? How can we know the way if, you don't even, if we don't even know where it is that you're going to? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I imagine Thomas would have turned around after Jesus said this, maybe looked at some of the other disciples and said, I'm not sure that that answered the question that I just asked. And you know, sometimes I think that we can all get a little bit like that, that we can look at things and say, I'm not sure that that quite answered the question that I just asked. And for many of us, we may have questions about Christianity. We may have questions about church. We may have questions about things that are going on around us, even with the things that are going on in the world at the moment. We may have questions and quite often we can ask our questions and it seems like we're not getting an answer to those. But I believe that in this passage that Jesus says here in John 14 and verse 6, when he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. There are three things here that Jesus says, and I believe these aren't three individual separate things, but these three things stand together and support one another, a bit like a three-legged stool, each leg bearing the weight, supporting one another that it holds together. And I believe each one of these three things is vital to the other in order to answer the question that Thomas had asked. And as we continue to read through the book of John, a little bit later, we find out why Thomas gets the name Doubting Thomas. It's because Jesus has died, rose again, but Thomas wasn't there when it happened. And the disciples say, we've seen Jesus alive again. And Thomas turns around and says, unless I see him for myself, I won't believe it. This is where he gets his name Doubting Thomas. And I really think that sometimes it's a little bit unfair that we characterize him like this. As I say, I think maybe Thomas is just a bit of a realist and needed to know for sure. He needed to see the things how they were. And you know what happens is misconceptions and stereotypes can be built up around people. We can get our understanding of people based on the impression that they build. And I imagine that it's probably happened to you as well. I know it's happened to me that there's been times where someone has built an interpretation and an understanding of me based on something that I've said once or the way that I appear, just because of that, they will build this interpretation, their understanding, their impression of who I am. But I find that actually what happens is we do the same things with the stuff that's going on around us, is we see things happening around us and we take our interpretation of it, our understanding of those things, and we take that and make that fact rather than actually getting the full picture, the full understanding of things. And you know, one of the things that I'm uh, reminded of is when pilots are flying a plane, if they're flying in difficult conditions, either in the dark or where it's foggy and they can't see out of the windows in front of them, they can't rely on their eyes, on the things that their eyes see in order to guide them to where they're going, but they have to trust the instruments that are placed out in front of them 
to know that this is the right direction, that we're going where we're supposed to be going and that we're flying at the right height, we're flying at the right speed and in the right direction. They have to have something that they can lean on and trust. And if they use their eyes, many times they will look out the window and they won't be able to trust the things that they're seeing. And I think in life we do the same things. That rather than having something solid that we can lean on and depend on, we begin to build our understanding of things based on what our eyes see. We begin to build our understanding of things based on our life experiences, the people that we come into contact with, and the things that happen to us. This is how we begin to shape our understanding of things. And you know, I really think that this is how some people shape their understanding of God and of Jesus as well is that they go off what happens to them around them, maybe what happens to people that they love and care about. They see the way that they're treated by people who are supposedly representing Christ. The truth of the matter is that no matter who you are, none of us are perfect, we all get things wrong. Whether we're Christian or not, whether we believe in God or not, we all make mistakes, we all do things wrong, but the way that we react and interact with other people can shape the way that people perceive things. And I love the fact that Jesus lays out here three things, and these three things work together to produce a true representation of exactly what Jesus did on the cross for us. You see, some people will see God as someone who is judgmental, someone who looks down and says, you need to do this in order to get things right. Other people will see God as someone distant, someone that they can't have a relationship. He's someone that oversees things from afar but isn't close to them. Some people will see God as someone who's let them down more times than they can remember. But I want to challenge you guys this morning that that isn't the true God that we see in the Bible. That isn't the true God that we can get to know if we understand these three principles that Jesus is laying out. That he is the way, the truth and the life. And that when we begin to follow these three things, that our understanding of him begins to change. I want to share with you a video this morning of a, guy called Lacey, a girl called Lacey Stern. And her testimony takes this same journey, that she has an understanding of who God is that has been built up by past experiences and by things that have gone on around her. But there is a moment, a breaking point, as it were, where Robert hits the road and she has to find this true understanding of who Christ is to her. I want you to take a few moments and to watch this video. My mom always told me about God. I think I had an idea that God was big and good, but as time went on and I saw more and more tragic things happen around me, I think that was the beginning of me just questioning everything about life and about God. When I was 10 years old, my stepdad came to pick me up and he said that my cousin Kelly was dead. I remember being so mad and really just, just deciding that if God was big and good, why wouldn't he protect my cousin who was so tiny and so awesome, such a funny, brilliant little guy. Why wouldn't God protect him from a huge muscle guy like his stepdad who beat him to death? That was the year I started to cry myself to sleep every night and stopped believing in God. I couldn't get away from my own depression. So I started studying other religions. There was a lot of nice ideas, but there wasn't any tangible healing. And I remember thinking, I'm tired of the pain in my heart. I'm tired of going to bed that way. I'm tired of feeling like a burden. I'm just tired of not knowing why I'm alive. And so I remember the night I laid in bed and I knew I was going to commit suicide the next day. I knew that I was not going to live past tomorrow. Uh, 
On the day that I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school and my grandma was there and she wasn't supposed to be there. And she looked at me and said, there's something wrong with you. You're gonna go to church. I was like, no way I'm going to church. And she screamed at the top of her lungs like we were fighting back and forth and I just didn't want to listen to her yell anymore. And so I decided, fine, I'll go. And then afterwards, I'll go ahead and follow through with my plan. So I went to the back of the church and slumped down in my chair and hated everybody in the room. And the pastor started speaking and I hated him more than anyone. And he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room. And of course, all the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I was, well, this is really weird. <laughs> and I got up and went to the door. A white-headed man was standing there and he stopped me. And it was like, the Lord wants me to speak to you. He wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. God knows the pain in your heart. He's seen you cry yourself to sleep at night. The idea was so overwhelming to me. He's like, do you want me to pray for you so that Jesus can take the pain out of your heart? He put his hand on my shoulder and started to pray. It was as if the God of the universe showed up right in front of me. And the first thing I noticed was that God was holy and good. And the second thing I noticed was that I was so not holy and not good. If God had looked at me and said, go away forever, he would have been right. It would have been just as. The same time I felt that, I felt him inviting me to an embrace of grace and love unconditional. It was like God was saying, I love you. I know you're tired of the way you've been living and I will make you new if you will let me. My heart was just yes, it just said yes, I, I need that, I want that, please. And that's why I woke up the next day. I just felt such a peace and a joy almost that I'd never felt before. Jesus saved my life, and on top of everything else, the life of my son and the new baby. That wouldn't be if Jesus hadn't intervened and rescued me. And the most overwhelming thing is to think that Jesus became sin, and it was my sin. And it was things that I've done. The house him on the cross, it was things that I've done. He hung naked on a cross, bleeding in a shameful way, so that I would never have to be ashamed for the things that I've done. The truth is, the truth is, there is no other way besides Christ and what he did. There is no life outside of that. Just take a moment to think on that. To think about the fact that 2,000 years ago, a man hung on a cross for every mistake that you would ever make. That 2,000 years ago, a man died so that you could walk in life. 2,000 years ago, there was an exchange that happened that enabled you to step into something greater than you've ever experienced before. Maybe you've known God before. Maybe you've never had that relationship, that experience of knowing who he is to you, of knowing that when we come to God, we go 
from a place of uncertainty to a place of truth. We go from having no idea of the way that we're supposed to go in life, of having no desire to continue. We go from that place to knowing the way that he is calling us to walk. We go from a place of having no hope to being filled with his hope. There was this exchange that took place 2,000 years ago, whereby one man turning up and saying, I want to give myself for you. Everything changed in that moment. So at this moment, you could know the man who died for you. I want you to imagine for a moment, you have an old mobile phone, one that's broken, beaten up and a bit, bit falling apart. The screen's smashed and the things aren't working on it. Some of the buttons have fallen off. And this phone is on contract. And when you take it into the store, they say that you're entitled to an upgrade on your phone. You can get the very best, the newest phone available. All you have to do is exchange your old phone. There's no other cost. All you have to do is give in this old broken phone for this brand new one. I think all of us would say that it's a no-brainer. In that moment, we would turn around, we would hand the phone over to the cashier at the counter and we would say, take it, it's yours, it wasn't worth anything to me anyway. In that moment, we would grab hold of the new thing, that brand new phone that represents such a fresh new beginning. We would take that home and treasure it. This is the opportunity that's being offered to you now. That you can go from feeling like you are worthless, like there's no good thing in you, like you're broken and beaten and there's nothing left. You can go from that moment to knowing that because of one man's act 2,000 years ago, because of what Jesus did for you, you can now exchange all of the things that you've ever done wrong. All of the broken parts of your life you can give to him in exchange for his life. There's a verse in the Bible in Galatians 2 and it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. In other words, it's saying that that moment 2,000 years ago that Jesus died on a cross was the moment that I surrendered everything that I would ever do wrong. That moment that Jesus died for me, before I was even around, before I was even born, Jesus knew that that was the moment that he was dying for every mistake that I could ever make. And that I take this moment to choose to crucify all of those things, all of the things that I do wrong. I put them on the cross and say, I don't want them anymore. My old life has gone and I'm exchanging it for his life. And in his life, there is so much more. It says in the Bible that he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might be called the righteousness of God. What that means is that Jesus died for us, taking all the things that we had ever done wrong upon himself, that we might be able to walk into the very throne room of God. We might be able to stand in God's presence as though we were the perfect heir to his throne. We were the perfect son, the perfect daughter, able to walk into his presence as though we had never done anything wrong. There is a God who wants to meet you this morning, who sees you, not for all the mistakes that you've made, not for all the things that you've done wrong, but sees you for who he created you to be. You know, we take this moment to think about the fact that Jesus died for us. And in that moment, it's something that echoes throughout history that over the last 2,000 years, people have proclaimed the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People have come into a relationship and an understanding of what it means to know God personally. We've seen over the years and through history, thousands upon thousands and millions of people coming into a relationship with God. 
we see giants of the faith who have proclaimed God to millions of people. We've seen people share their love of God with other people. And you have an opportunity this morning, if you've never entered into a relationship with God, if you've never known God personally, he's standing there and waiting this morning to say, I want to know you. All he wants is for you to give over everything that you've ever done wrong, all the parts of you that no longer make any sense. I believe that there are people who are watching this morning who've reached a point in life where they say, things just don't make sense anymore. I don't even know why I'm here. And I believe that if in this moment you choose to give everything over to God, to say, take all of the rubbish, take all of the things that I no longer want, I want a new life. That in that moment, like this scripture says, he will become your way, your truth, and your life. That it is through Christ Jesus that you can have all of these things. One of the people that we've seen through history, bringing millions of people to know Christ is a guy called Billy Graham. Many of you will have heard of him. And Billy Graham passed away last year, but his legacy lives on. And I want to share a clip with you now from something that Billy Graham recorded. There is no other way of salvation except through the cross of Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The only way to the Father, Father God, is through his Son, Jesus Christ. Now why Jesus? He's the only one that was born into this world without sin. But more than that, he was a righteous one. And when you come to him, you're clothed in his righteousness. God no longer sees your sin. He no longer sees your own heart. He sees Jesus. Now, I don't understand all about it. There are many things about the cross and about salvation that I do not understand, and I'm not told that I have to understand it all. I'm told that I'm to believe, and that word believe means commit. I commit my life totally to Him. Jesus Christ from the cross says, I will save you. I will forgive you. I will change you. I'll make you a new person if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Come to Christ. When you come to Christ, you come by the way of repentance. Repent means to change, to change your way of living and turn from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ and say, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. And I know that you're the only one that can change me.
the Bible says, in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, he became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. Christ took the hell that you and I deserve. Now God said, receive him. Believe in him. Put your trust and your confidence in him, and I will forgive your sins, and I will guarantee you eternity in heaven. It's all yours, and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. Today, I'm asking you to put your trust in Christ. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer, sentence by sentence, after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you've died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? You can have that same assurance, that same knowledge that no matter what happens, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm called for and what I'm called to do. And all it takes is that one decision to say today, I make that choice. Today, I make that choice to enter into a family of people who all know what we're called to do, who have an assurance that this is the God that I know and love. This is the God who gives me a hope and a future. We are a family of people who are called to show the light and the love of God to the world around us. And if you're watching this and you're part of that family, then I want to challenge you this morning to ensure that you show God's love in every way that you can. That you have an opportunity to be a beacon of hope to a dark and hopeless world. If you make a decision to join this family, then you have the opportunity to be a carrier of hope. This morning on Easter Sunday, I want to challenge you all to be carriers of hope, to be people who bring hope to those who need it most. And it starts right where you are, right now, sharing that hope with those closest to us and those that we come into contact with each and every day. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. I pray God blesses you and have an amazing week. We love spending time with you and it's been such a privilege to share with you guys this morning. God bless. Hey Church, what an awesome service this week. We just want to thank you for connecting with us and we love you, we care for you. If there is anything we can do, please get in touch with us. We would love to connect with you this week and we'll be praying for you. And if there's anything you felt has really touched your heart throughout this, please get in touch. We would love to pray with you and connect with you. Yeah, and as we've heard this morning that Jesus is alive, Jesus is risen. And church, this week, no matter what we face, we can face it head on because Jesus has given us the power and authority to face it. Because he lives, we can face fear, anxiety, depression, doubt. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. 
Church, we love you and we encourage you and we pray for you this week. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. Stay connected. Pray for one another and be encouraged. Bye, church. Oh,